Well, um, thank you all. I only see um, a few faces. I think a lot of people have their video off, which is totally fine. Um, and you can mute if you'd like. So welcome to the Sabre uh, Ken Keltner Book Club. And our selection is How Baseball Happened by Thomas Gilbert. I love this. Outrageous lies exposed. I hope you expose these outrageous lies. So um, I'll Tom. touch on that tonight. Yeah. So um, yeah, I never thought I was very interested in 19th century baseball until I read this. And I had seen um, your, Tom, your presentation with the 19th century committee, I think you did a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. And um, just really well done, but the book is fantastic. So I'll let you, uh, if you'd like to do your slideshow, you can take it away if you'd like. Sure, I'm gonna just talk a little bit and then I'll start the slides. Absolutely. Um, I'll start with the title because it's a little different. Um, the book is called how baseball happened. And then we have this uh, little bit Barnum-esque subtitle, Outrageous Lies Exposed the Truth Revealed, something like that. Real story revealed, true story revealed. True story so, revealed, yeah. As, you know, we were hoping the title might suggest this isn't a nor you know, the usual kind of baseball history book. Um, in fact, most of it isn't really about baseball. It's about the context that baseball happened in. So it's about American history. Um, the idea for this book happened when I had sort of a realization after decades of researching early baseball history, you know, which and the early history of baseball is, is here where I live in Brooklyn and in New York. Um, it occurred to me, and I, and also having read almost everything written on this topic, that if you listed maybe the three or four or five biggest questions about early baseball history, we didn't have answers to them, which I thought was interesting. Um, it's not that it hasn't been studied, but we didn't know where baseball really came from. We didn't know how a game that appears to be an ancient folk or children's game suddenly evolved very quickly into being a mature adult sport. Um, why did a regional bat and ball game from New York become our national sport fairly quickly? And it wasn't for lack of competition. There were other local bat and ball games that are mostly forgotten. There was cricket, which was way ahead of baseball in the pre-Civil War America. So that led to another realization that we baseball historians might have been focusing too narrowly on things like who won what game and what club was formed when, sort of the what, where, and when, and not as much on the who, which is a particularly important question when you're talking about amateur baseball. Because these people, the, all these clubs were social organizations formed by their members. Um, there were ideas um, and intentions behind this beyond just playing baseball. Um, well, what I found is that asking that question, who, leads you to a lot of new places and missing answers to some of these big questions. So I'm not going to try and summarize this book tonight, which uh, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear. Let me just go by a few of the topics that illustrate what I'm saying. So I want to start with a, a little bit of a mental trip back to the place where baseball was born, early 19th century America. Um, it's hard to believe for modern pe Americans, but there was a time when we didn't have any baseball and any team sports to speak of. Uh, sports are, as we all know, a huge deal in our country today. The rest of the world looks at America and sees a sports obsessed country where the four seasons of the year are baseball, football, basketball, and ice hockey, where ordinary people run and work out into their 40s and 50s and older, where old age and golf are inseparable, and where you know, someone invented the word athleisure. Until shortly before the Civil War, though, America was known for the exact opposite. We were a country with no team sports, no leagues or championships, no ballparks, no stadiums. Nobody followed or rooted for their hometown team because there weren't any. Mainstream newspapers didn't have sports sections. American adults weren't interested in playing or watching team sports. There was one exception, cricket. And that, not surprisingly, was dominated by immigrants from Great Britain, which at that time were 6% of the US population. And then baseball springs up as if out of nowhere. Born in New York City as a casual folk game, and it was called, uh, often before the Civil War, the New York game. Baseball became an organized sport and began to spread outside the city in the late 1850s, and first as recreation, second as entertainment. And it was completely and gloriously new. It was American-made, 
it wasn't primarily about betting, which almost every other popular sport was, horse racing, boxing. It blazed the path that all American sports have followed since. Now, I start my book by talking about baseball's own origin stories, and I'm sure you've heard them. And if you're a Sabre member, you probably know they're not exactly accurate. But you may not have thought too much about how untrue they are or why. Um, this is the first sentence of my book. There's more than one way to get history wrong. Sometimes the truth is forgotten. Sometimes it is misunderstood. Sometimes it, er is it, er it is erased and replaced with lies. But when it comes to telling the story of where it came from, baseball has accomplished all three. And that's where the outrageous lies of the subtitle come in. Why outrageous? It's not just that these stories are false, but the people that told them knew they were false. They're intentionally false. And it reminds me of something I learned from doing genealogical research, uh, in my own family and other people's. You know, there's something random and, and in some ways not very interesting about facts, but lies tell you a lot. Lies tell you a lot about who people are and what, what their values are. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna start my slideshow and talk a little bit about baseball's two origin myths. So let's see here. I'm gonna share. And is everybody seeing Abner? Yes, I see it. Okay. All right, this is the, you know, the, um, I would say the most famous baseball origin story. The story of the Doubleday story um, dates back to the professional era, the early 1900s, when Major League club owner and sporting goods magnate Albert Spaulding, who published Spaulding's official baseball guide, which was the official annual of professional baseball, found himself in a public debate over baseball's origins with one of his own employees, the Spalding Guide's 80-year-old and somewhat crotchety editor, Henry Chadwick. Spalding is a fascinating character. He was born and raised in Rockford, Illinois, when that town wasn't very far from the Western frontier. A star pitcher as a teenager, he retired at the age of 27. Does anybody know why he retired so young? Um, he wasn't yeah. hurt. He was getting too rich manufacturing sporting goods to be bothered with playing. Um, look at his stats sometime. They're, they're pretty amazing. Um, he was the, also the author of the first actual baseball history. He was the co-founder of the National League and the de facto chief executive of Major League Baseball in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, Henry Chadwick was the most important early baseball writer, but he was also baseball's chief promoter. He was sort of a one-man marketing and publicity department for baseball. He was one of the earliest and most influential New Yorkers to grasp the importance of selling sports to an emerging new class of prosperous urbanites that some historians call the emerging urban bourgeoisie, and I just call them the EUB in my book. So who were these people? Um, they were prosperous, upperly mobile, reform-minded urbanites. They're the ancestors of our modern middle class. And they're the people with the time, money, and inclination for adult exercise and sport. And <clears throat> at the time that baseball decided it wanted to be America's national sport, these were the people that had growing social influence and men like Chadwick hoped that they would lend some of their prestige to baseball. In the early uh, 1900s, Chadwick, who had come to Brooklyn from England as a boy, came up with a theory that baseball came from an English children's game called Rounders. You've probably heard this theory. These were fighting words in 1907, when the United States was emerging from Great Britain's shadow as a world power, not to mention that baseball had always marketed itself as 100% American. Spalding's response was to create something called the Mills Commission, which concluded on less than zero evidence that Abner Doubleday had invented baseball as a teenager in 1839. And who was Doubleday? A career military man, um, distinguished himself in the Civil War and the Mexican War, and a prolific memoirist. And to give you an idea of how false the Doubleday story really is, in 1893, Doubleday died and was given a great funeral in New York City, where he was eulogized by his good friend, A.G. Mills, who failed to mention, neither did anyone else that day, that Doubleday had invented baseball or had any interest in baseball whatsoever. 
This is the same AG Mills who chaired the commission that 15 years later decided that Doubleday had invented our national pastime. The Doubleday story replaced an earlier origin story that dated back to the mid 1850s, the Knickerbocker story, which often features a banker named Alexander Cartwright. Today, that story has made a big comeback. If you Google the origins of baseball today, something like this will pop up on your screen. In 1845, a group of amateur athletes from New York City formed the first baseball club and published the first rules. In some versions, bank, bank clerk Alexander Cartwright was the driving force. All the Knickerbockers were white men, almost all were native born Protestants. Among other rules innovations, the club was the first to outlaw the practice of soaking, which meant throwing the ball at base runners to put them out, which was an important step forward in baseball's evolution. Running out of playing space and booming New York City, the Knickerbockers wandered in the wilderness until in 1845, they found a home on the leafy Elysian fields in Hoboken, New Jersey, 15 minutes by ferry from lower Manhattan. The Knickerbockers were influential gentlemen who popularized the game and up sprang clubs like the Eagles, Gotham's, Empires, followed by more imitators in Brooklyn, New Jersey and the metropolitan area. The Knickerbockers ruled over baseball until, to their dismay, the game spread downward to the unwashed working classes. As it spread outward to Boston, Philadelphia and elsewhere, the Knickerbockers lost control of the sport they had made, opening a Pandora's box of professionalism, gambling and corruption. Well, two parts of the story are true. Almost all the Knickerbockers were white American born Protestants and the Barclay Street Ferry did in fact get you to Hoboken in 15 minutes. The Knickerbocker rules don't really contain anything new. They describe how the New York version of the game had been played for some time, quite likely by all kinds of different kinds of people. The rules were not the first written rules, just the oldest set that we have. Most Knickerbockers were merchants, professionals, and businessmen, but they were not gentlemen, as that word was used in the mid 19th century, which meant living on inherited wealth. They were influential, but their ambition was not to make the game popular. If anything, it was the opposite. According to William Wheaton, one of the club's founders, he and his friends founded the Knickerbockers in order not to have to play with men they considered their social inferiors. In 1936, when the Knickerbockers were a fading memory, the folks promoting the idea of a baseball hall of fame used Abner Doubleday's myth to justify locating it in Cooperstown, New York, where the future Civil War commander may have attended prep school. This provided a backlash from some historians and relatives of Alexander Cartwright. And to avoid controversy, the baby was apportioned. Cooperstown got the hall. Cartwright, who for all we know was not even a particularly good athlete, got a plaque in the same room as Babe Ruth and Christy Matthewson. If you visit the Hall of Fame today, you will read this, what it says on this plaque here, um, that Alexander Joy Cartwright is the father of modern baseball, that he set the bases 90 feet apart, established nine innings as a game, organized the Knickerbocker Baseball Club in 1845, and carried the game to the West Coast in Hawaii. He didn't do any of those things. But you can't edit a bronze plaque, which I often wondered is why they made out of, uh, wondered if that's why they made them out of bronze. So what is the point of these lies? Well, the main one, and both these versions have this in common, is that to underline the idea that baseball is native born and completely American, has nothing to do with England or Europe. If it was invented by a particular American at a particular time and place, it cannot be in any way English. And B, that playing baseball is respectable a proper use of an adult's time. If men like the Knickerbockers were playing it, it couldn't have any connection with gambling, drinking, or violence, which is what respectable Protestant Americans of the time associated with most all-male activities. So the respectability concern is easy to understand, but what was the problem with Englishness? Well, welcome to mid 19th century America, a country that looked up to England but also feared, hated, and resented the so-called mother country. There was a sports movement that, loose sports movement that sprang up in the early 19th century, um, populated by people who thought we needed a national sport the way the U UK had cricket. In the 1830s and 40s, this movement was looking for the right sport to get Americans interested in exercise. It tried boxing and gymnastics, neither of which really flew, and then it tried cricket. Cricket had lots of advantages. 
It was a maturing international sport played by teams in the open air. It had already come to the U.S. from Great Britain. Most early baseball players knew how to play it. And all you needed was a lawn, a bat, a ball, and a couple of sticks. Reporters for the American Sports Weeklies, many of whom were English, tried to sell cricket as a national sport for Americans, but they failed. The American dog would not eat the English dog food. And why not? Well, the US and the UK today are the best of friends. We fight alongside the British in wars, consume their entertainment, enjoy reading about their royal family. We like Downton Abbey. We admire our former colonial masters. We don't fear them. But that's not what the relationship was like in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. So the America of the pre-Irish uh, potato famine refugees was shockingly nativist and Protestant. Over 95% of the New York City population in 1845 was born in the United States. Now, nativism was a powerful political force. We associate it today with hostilities to immigrants, particularly sort of non-WASP immigrants, Asians, Africans, Latinos. But 19th century nativism was also hostile to Great Britain, Catholicism, Europe in general. America at that time saw itself as exceptional and needing protection from interference and influence by the corrupt old world. It was common in pre-Civil War New York City, for instance, for nativist institutions like militia units and social clubs to exclude the foreign born, even people who had come from England as infants. So 19th century Americans feared UK's military power. Only two, our two wars of independence were vivid in the living memory of many when, in the decade in which baseball became a sport. Only 30 years before the founding of the Knickerbockers, a British army had burned the White House down. Many New Yorkers of the time had fathers and grandfathers who fought or died for their country's independence from England. I find it ironic today that few Americans could tell you what the War of 1812 was about, but we stand up and sing about it before every professional baseball game. So how powerful a force was American nativism? It was very powerful. It elected presidents and it got people killed. I don't know if you ever heard of this event. There are many events like this that happened in the 1830s, 40s and 50s. But in 1849 in New York, this was called the Astor Place Theater Riot. And what happened was um, England had a great Shakespearean actor named William McCready. And his American counterpart, who we claimed was the best Shakespearean actor living, was a guy named Ned Forrest. And it would have been a pretty unimportant theatrical rivalry, except it got politicized. And um, it took on overtones of nationalism, of nativism, of class conflict even. And unfortunately, both those actors happened to be playing the same part in the same Shakespeare play uh, within a few blocks of each other in New York in 1849. And nativist politicians like Isaiah Rinders and uh, Ned Buntline, they roused up angry crowds, uh, incited them to break up the performance of the British production of Macbeth that was going on, um, throwing garbage at the stage, they, they shut it down, they chased the actor through the streets. Um, the mayor sort of Anglophile political establishment decided they were gonna show the mob who was boss, and they brought in the 7th uh, New York State Militia, and they brought artillery for some reason. Um, and it's sort of a classic police riot. It illustrates what goes wrong when you bring too many guns to something. Um, the crowd advances toward them. The militiamen get scared. They fire warning shots. The crowd keeps coming. They shoot at their legs. They get very angry. Uh, 30 people died, and 100 people were shot in a dispute over who was the best Shakespearean actor. And the whole thing is inflamed by nativism. So the reason I'm telling this story is that I think I've come to the conclusion that that's the biggest single reason why cricket didn't make it. Because you'll read in history books that cricket is unsuited to Americans for various reasons or we weren't familiar with it. And none of that is really true. Almost all the amateur era baseball players knew how to play cricket and some of them were excellent at it. Um, I think the problem was marketing. It was, it was British. And I think that in itself was disqualifying. And William F. Ladd, another founding member of the Knickerbockers, who was, uh, gave an interview remembering how the club was founded, said these words. 
The reason we chose the game of baseball instead of, and in fact, in opposition to cricket, was because we regarded Amer baseball as a purely American game. And there was at that time considerable prejudice against adopting any game of foreign inter invention, unquote. Well, that's what he's saying. So cricket was out. But why did the sports movement settle on the New York game, not bat and ball games that were played in Boston, Philadelphia, or elsewhere? The short answer is that New Yorkers were at the forefront of the American sports movement. And that movement drew on the economic and cultural power and prestige of New York City, which not coincidentally was the center of American publishing and where all the sports weeklies of the time were printed. So it's not shocking on, on that level that they chose a game they were familiar with. In 1858, 25 baseball clubs met and formed a governing body called the National Association of Baseball Players. And it's, the title is somewhat amusing because all the clubs were from the New York City metropolitan area except the Liberties of New Brunswick, New Jersey, which isn't very far from New York. And one of the first things they did was invent an origin story, the Knickerbocker story, to help promote the game. Baseball succeeded as our first national sport with an amazing suddenness. So the story starts in Lower Manhattan in the mid 1850s, where baseball had been played by a few handful of clubs for decades, but the baseball world was really, really small. And how small was it? This is a, a uh, you know, imagined picture of what baseball looked like in 1854. And there's a few people watching it. Um, spectators were, pretty few and far between at that time. But we happen to have a letter from 1854 where William Van Cott, the president of the Gotham Club, he wrote a letter to all the new newspapers in New York City, urging them to cover this sport, this which he said was a coming thing. And he boasts that there are three clubs with 90 players. Okay, that's baseball in 1854. Well, uh, 11 years later, this is baseball. So baseball is a fully developed national sport played almost everywhere. We're five years from the first National Professional Sports League, the National Association. Baseball is being called the national pastime. It's played coast to coast, north to south. There are fans, ballparks, star players, crowds, newspaper coverage, stats, national championships. Um, a really fat thing that always, always fascinated me is that uh, baseball became a fully evolved national sport. It's sort of structurally and culturally and in almost every way fully formed before there was a professional league. The pros, um, they invented professional baseball. They didn't invent the sport of baseball in any sense. If you look at this picture, it's a championship game between the athletics and the Brooklyn Atlantics and the uh, players are clearly recognizable people. Um, there's grandstands, there's people with programs, there's betting touts, there's pickpockets, there's all kinds of interesting things going on there, but baseball's big business. So a big hefty part of my book is about, well, exactly how did it spread outward from New York? And the game didn't spread the way I'd always sort of imagined it did, like when you throw a pebble in a pond and the, uh, the waves uh, go out in a uniform way. Um, that's not the way it spread. And the reason is um, it followed New Yorkers and it followed certain kinds of New Yorkers. Um, whenever you go to a place, and this would be true in Milwaukee, this would be true in Richmond, Virginia, this would be true in New Orleans, and you find the earliest known baseball clubs and you look up, you see the names, which don't mean much, you know, you know, you see names in a box score, you, then you do the work of finding out who these people are. And what you see is patterns. And you'll see that on almost every case, the early baseball players were men who'd come there from New York. Um, and they were in certain businesses that were sort of cutting edge technologically, techno techno technologically, like you get printers, you get newspaper men, you get telegraph people, people in the railroad business. Um, these are the most typical professions. Um, these are people who are um, on the cutting edge communications and transportation uh, technologies. And it's not a coincidence because to them, baseball was, what excited them about it was that it was a way to unify the United States, just as 
the industries that they were working in did. Now, if you look at this map, this is the population density of the United States in 1850. And the darkest places is where um, baseball uh, sank its deepest roots early. A big step was conquering Philadelphia and Boston that had their own bat and ball games. Um, this map illustrates pretty vividly how concentrated the US population was before the Civil War in a narrow corridor dominated by New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. This is the reason why the Northeastern quadrant of the country produced baseball talent well into the 20th century, and why until the year I was born, every major league franchise fit into this quadrant. This is a map that we did for my book, and it's kind of a fun one because it shows the route baseball took out of the New York area. And it looks like a bunch of, uh, there's looks like there's not much pattern there, but actually what's going on here is um, it's going where New Yorkers went and it's, it explains why, for instance, there's a, game, a, a club in Sacramento, California um, before um, there's a club in say Richmond, Virginia. And there's, there's a reason behind every one of these routes. Um, New Yorkers went to California in the gold rush. That's the simple reason why there was baseball in California. Um, Philadelphia and Boston held out for a while. Baseball, the center of baseball in the South was all the way down in New Orleans because New Yorkers were uh, uh, all over the cotton business. First cotton exchange was in New York City because New Yorkers financed the buying of slaves, the buying of machines, the buying of land, the selling of the cotton, the selling of the textiles, shipping it to Europe. Um, a lot of those people were involved in baseball. So baseball spread um, by the national sports media, which at a certain point switches from cricket to baseball. Um, it was spread by club tours of amateur clubs, national conventions, and indirectly by, as I mentioned, transportation technology, um, <clears throat> you can actually follow baseball up the Hudson River by steamboat out the Erie Canal uh, to the Midwest. You can follow it on the railroad line that led uh, through um, Southern Ontario to Detroit. The early Canadian clubs are not in the big cities. They're right along the Great Western Railway <laughs> in places you've probably never heard of in Southern Ontario. Um, so one other route that baseball took that I want to mention, which is kind of interesting, is uh, prep schools and colleges, because the New Yorkers who play baseball send their children to uh, schools, prep schools and colleges. And very early on, for instance, Yale and Harvard had baseball clubs founded by people from Brooklyn or New York. Um, the Cincinnati Red Stockings were founded by men who caught baseball fever because they were at Harvard Law School in the 1860s when the first club was formed. And baseball went to Cuba and much of Latin America because of wealthy men who sent their children to places like Fordham. Uh, the founder of the Cuban Professional League played for Fordham and also played professionally, Esteban Bayon. Okay, this is my last slide before I answer some questions. So I'm gonna give you one more example of what you can learn from asking the question, who? Um, you may know about this game. This is June 14th, 1870. This was the game in which the Cincinnati Red Stockings winning streak that had started in late 1868, eight, so it lasted over parts of three seasons, was broken. And it was broken by uh, the Brooklyn Atlantics. So most history books will tell you that the Red Stockings were professional, first professional team. The Atlantics were an amateur team. Um, and this game is sort of portrayed as a Camelot-like victory for the doomed amateurism in baseball. Um, that's not exactly what true. In 1868, businessmen in Cincinnati decided to build a top baseball club to promote their town. And they paid top dollar for a virtual national all-star team. Only one of the players was from Cincinnati. The truth is that in 1869 and 70, almost all the top amateur clubs were play, paying their players. Cincinnati's real innovation wasn't being first in professionalism. It was in hiring what you might call mercenaries, the best players they could get at each position from all over the country. 
every member of the Brooklyn Atlantics, for instance, lived in Brooklyn and had come up through the Atlantics network of youth clubs. And I stumbled upon the fact when I was trying to figure out what the Atlantics were paid, that they were paid a percentage of the gate. And that computes to a lot more money than the Red Stockings were making. So uh, George Wright, I think, was making something like $1,600 a year. Well, for this one game, the Atlantics got $368 a head. And they played many, many games during the season. So um, anyway, what happened was, I won't tell the whole story of the game, but the Brooklyn Atlantics win in the 11th in a very dramatic way. And um, I view this game as not a turning point in the history of professionalism, but in the relationship between clubs and their communities. Um, this is what the Brooklyn Daily Eagle said about this dramatic win. They said, quote, this marks the first break in the line of battle hitherto waged by a ball organization, which chooses to call itself Cincinnati, but which belongs to the four quarters of the country. It was the greatest game ever played between the greatest clubs ever played. And this Red Stockings Club was not formed as our club was by young men who loved the game and played for pleasure. They are literally nothing but a pick nine of professional players, the best that could be hired from all parts of the country. And the purpose of their organization is to make money by ball playing. That sounds a little odd to us because all of the teams we root for are made up of hired mercenaries. The Red Stockings success contributed to the founding of the national, first national uh, professional league in 1871 the National League in 1876. But as I said before, the pros didn't invent baseball or even the sport of baseball. Amateurs had done that. The ideals of the amateur era have, a, have staying power and they're still around today. Um, you'll notice that when a hometown player makes a professional team, a club, um, a Greg Council, for instance, uh, in the case of Milwaukee, people get extra excited about that. And you know, you might ask why because all the teams are hired guns. But we love the idea that there's some connection to the community. Um, we like to think that these professional franchises belong to us in some way. And the truth is they only belong to us in the sense that we pay for them. And there's the cover of my book. And I would be delighted to answer questions. Let me get out of the... Um, is anyone interested in this illustration before I turn this picture off? Are you familiar with that picture? That's a game played on July 4th, 1862 in Salisbury, North Carolina, POW camp by Union soldiers. And you should get a high resolution picture of this phot photograph if you're interested in look at it because it has a lot of humor to it. It was based on a drawing by a professional artist who was a German American officer in a New York unit. And Several of these, a lot of these people are recognizable uh, persons. But what's going on in the picture is that all the New Yorkers have formed one team and everybody else is on the other team. Tells you something about the balance of power in baseball. And he makes a point that all of the Confederate guards are paying absolutely zero attention to the game. Um, I don't think they probably even understood it. So let me stop the share here and are you seeing me on the screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, your, your slideshow is, is gone now. Good. Okay. So um, I am ready to answer some questions if anybody has any. I, I have a number, but I'd like other people to weigh in. Um, yeah, this, this illustration on the cover is amazing. There's a lot going on. Um, but. I, I wonder if you wanted to talk about James Creighton, you know, um, which is another, we always think of Candy Cummings as the one who invented the curveball, but um, I don't know if you want to mention anything well, about James Creighton. Yeah. I'm going to, um, I've always been interested in him and I'm writing a, a book about him, my next book. Excellent. Yeah. And yeah, people have tried and failed because he died at 21. There's not a lot of, in terms of his actual personal life, but there's a lot yeah, of short life, a lot of baseball history there. And, yeah, you mentioned the curveball, which is, an, you know, we know he was the first dominating fast pitcher. But it's really hard to tell exactly what he was doing on the mound. And I'm trying to figure that out myself. Um, we have descriptions of it, but um, the problem is, I mean, there's, there's basically a fundamental problem, which is if something's new, there's no word for it. So 
when people are describing how unhittable Creighton was, you can sort of try to piece it together. You know, um, Pete O'Brien said, the ball rises, he threw underhand. So the ball rises from the dirt and it jumps past you and you pop it up or you swing under it. I mean, that's a clue about what he was doing. But is it four seam kind of hop? Um, it's baffling how he got so much on the ball because he was clearly throwing harder than almost anybody else than anybody else. So there's two things we know about it. He was throwing much harder than everyone else and he was basically unhittable. Um, but the rules of the time uh, were, if you read the pitching rules of the time, you had to throw the, the shortest way to put it is throw the ball the way you'd pitch a horseshoe. Your arm had to be straight and directly dead underhand and with no wrist snap. You couldn't sort of buggy whip the ball. So how do you throw 70, 80 miles an hour like that? I have no idea. I have a few ideas, but it's a puzzler. And the other thing is we know there was a way to do it because other people imitated it almost immediately. So lots of people started pitching like him. But, you know, this used to really bother me. And then I thought about the fact that even in modern baseball, there are pitchers doing stuff. Like if you remember the recent spider attack controversy we had, that other pitchers are learning that fans and journalists don't know about. So we're looking at these games through the eyes of journalists who may not know what's going on. And Creighton almost immediately was accused of cheating simply because they couldn't figure out how could you throw that hard and, and be legal. But then people like Henry Chadwick got, took him out there, watched him pitch. Uh, people on opposing teams who had every reason of, to argue that he was cheating said, no, it looks legal to me. So that's also a clue. But to return to your question, um, was he throwing a curveball? Some people said that later, and I never took that that seriously until one day I was doing some research and I ran across a letter to the editor in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle from 1937. And this guy was angry because he heard that Candy Cummings was being uh, put in the Hall of Fame as the inventor of the curveball in the 1860s. And the guy who wrote the letter said, uh, BS, my uncle invented the curveball, but people didn't know what he was, what it was. And the person who wrote it was James Creighton Parks, Jim Creighton's nephew, who was a stockbroker living in northern New Jersey. Um, since then, I'm trying to keep an open mind about, and I think it's possible that he was throwing a curveball, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I thought it was, yeah, your book is so entertaining and it's, and it was just, I was trying to pick the way you described him pitching, you know, I was trying to picture it. Like you said, we just don't have enough information. I'm actually, but it sounds like he twisted his body in a uh, yeah, strange I'm, way. I mean, I'm pretty sure that what was behind the velocity was a sort of hip torque. And another clue that uh, to what he was doing, plus this might shed some light on whether he was throwing a curveball, is in those days you were allowed to run up to a line and pitch the ball. And uh, he didn't. He took one stride. Now, it's pretty hard to throw a curveball on the run. And that could have been part of the reason. But um, I think he, what he did was he uncoiled very violently and got a lot of his, he got his hips into the ball in ways that other people didn't. And um, there may have been a little bit of disguised, what they used to call throwing in there, which is getting a little wrist snap on there. But, um, and that did become legal later, but um, I'm actually interviewing uh, women's fast pitch softball pitching coaches because they, they might have some to say about the that's uh, you know illuminating about the mechanics of it. Well, that was my next question. Is like yeah, like when did they? So it it sounds like James Creighton might have really kind of revolutionized pitching in many ways, and um, and also when did they go from like tossing underhand to actually throwing overhand? Yeah, so that was gradual, and yeah, it's the kind of thing where if you realize that you get an advantage from it, it's basically driven by the curveball because. The higher your arm angle, the more effective a curve is. You can throw it underhand, and people do, but it's kind of a riser that it doesn't do that much. The higher your arm angle is, of course, the more sweep you're getting and the more downward break. But um, you know, the the what they were doing was they were doing what they often do in baseball, which is the rule book is catching up with practice. So by the time they legalize kind of low three quarters, they're already throwing cider. But um, uh, the really I would say the number one most interesting possibility for Creighton's impact 
is, uh, I like to argue that he's the reason for the strike zone, which sounds kind of mind blowing, because when he was playing, there was no strike. Zone. Um, you were kind of on your honor to put the ball over the plate, and he he had beautiful control, but he was unhittable, and you know uh, it doesn't take very many seconds to of, of trying to imagine of what you would do if you were facing a guy. I mean, let's say you're playing in your weekend softball game and some guy's throwing a hundred and there's no, there's no called balls and strikes. What are you going to do? You're just going to stand there until he makes a mistake or gets tired. That's what they did to Creighton. Mm -hmm. So they started calling strikes, warning strikes because of him. And then fast pitchers who didn't have his control were throwing too many wild pitches and they started calling balls and it all starts. It's a long trail. I mean, that takes five or six years, but, um, you know, if you if you ask yourself who has had the greatest impact on baseball and baseball history, I, I don't think you can imagine anything bigger than being responsible for the strike zone directly and indirectly. You know, it kind of puts Babe Ruth in perspective, even. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Do you think he should be in the Hall of Fame? I do. I mean, I know why he isn't because he didn't play professional baseball. <laughs> but there are you know Henry Chadwick's in the Hall of Fame. He didn't either, but. Um, to me, you know, I'm hoping my book will do something about that because his impact is just unbelievable. N not to mention that he died at 21. So it's kind of amazing. I think it is. Yeah. yeah. So any questions from anyone? We have a lot of people who aren't visible, but I don't know if they're calling in or. Does anyone else have a question? Can I have a question? I have a question. Can I ask it this way? Tom, you, your, your photo kind of gives it away a little bit, but I do have a, you mentioned New Yorkers traveling, how baseball began, but how, does, how did the Civil War impact that? Did you find out, like, that's what I always read, like the North and the South played. Yeah, is that uh, true? Is that true? Or? No, that's a really great, complicated question that I try to answer in one chapter of my book. And all it's really tough to tell. And it, people, we all argue about this in the, in the field, but um, there's this, the problem is, like with the Doubleday story, there's a sort of romanticized version of history. And Abner, uh, Albert Spaulding, you know, promotes this in his book, written in 1911, that somehow baseball spread to the South because of the Civil War, that it helped bring the country together after the Civil War. I think a lot of that is kind of hooey. But um, the, uh, I mean, I can, I know that it doesn't make any, I've never found any evidence that of these supposed games between North and South under a flag of truce. There's no reason to think that the players playing in prison camps in, you know, somehow spread the game to the South. I mean, it was in the South already in certain places that usually had a close relationship economically with New York City. But um, after the war, you know, what the damage done to the Southern economy really stopped baseball in its tracks for a really long time in the South. Um, you know, Virginia, their railroad system was destroyed by the war. And this kind of put baseball into suspended animation. Um, the one thing that you can, I can prove that the Civil War did to help baseball was that it spread it from the Northeast to the Midwest. And I, I trace it very, um, in great detail in my book, because uh, there were about, uh, I think, uh, Three million different uh, individuals served in the Union Army, and something like uh, six or eight hundred thousand of them were from New York State, where everybody was playing baseball in their twenties at that point, and they had already started to play in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut. You, the war necessarily mixes people from different regions, and um, there's oral history about that, but you can actually find facts that back it up. If you look at the number of clubs that are founded in places like Michigan and Wisconsin, Iowa, um, Illinois, that there's a huge jump after the Civil War. And I think a lot of soldiers came home, at least in the what we call the Midwest, it used to be called the West, came home having learned baseball in the Army from people from the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. And there's no doubt about that. Baseball kind of had the opposite problem with the South, which is it was too associated with the North. Um, for Southern, even Southern baseball clubs didn't want to join national baseball organizations because they were identified with the recent enemy. 
I have a question, but uh, can you hear me first off? Yes. Okay, I finally got my speakers working. Thank you. Uh, but first, I have a comment uh, regarding uh, uh, the the curveball. Uh, I used to pay, play underhand softball for years, uh, which was uh, you didn't wind up like fast uh, pitch softball, but you threw as hard as you could. And there were some pitchers that were definitely throwing curve balls. Now they were not as pronounced as an overhand curve would be because you just didn't have that kind of speed. Uh, but it, it's definitely possible. You didn't see it a lot, but there were a couple of pitchers out there that could definitely make the ball move. Uh, so I, I would look at, at some of those uh, uh, as well, not just the, uh, I think you're on the right track with the, the women's uh, uh, fast pitch softball to, to see what the art of the possible is. But my question is, I'm a research writer and, and I've been, I live in Dubuque, Iowa. I belong to the Field of Dreams chapter, so I thank the Milwaukee chapter for putting this on and inviting others. Uh, and part of my research uh, regarding uh, the early development of baseball and, and my other research I've written about uh, our ra railroad history in Dubuque. Uh, and Dubuque was one of those points across the Mississippi River that was in competition to be part of the first transcontinental railroad. Uh, and it brought a lot of New Yorkers to the area to finance and build the railroads. And uh, uh, we have documented uh, uh, 1855 baseball exhibitions going on in Dubuque, but no matches. The first match happened in 1863. But we do have uh, documented uh, uh, the Sons of New York clubs uh, with you know 60 to 80 members in the 1850s. Uh, and the club happened to be the Excelsior Club. Uh, in 1865, Dubuque had uh, the Northwest uh, Baseball Championship while the National Baseball Championship was going on at the same time in 1865. Uh, and uh, uh, it was put on by predominantly New Yorkers and our team in Dubuque was predominantly New Yorkers of the Julian Baseball Club that the next year changed their name to the Excelsiors. So I'm wondering based off of your book, uh, where would I find a list, especially of the Excelsior Club, and so I can start comparing a lot of these folks that were uh, part of these teams. Uh, and by the way, a gentleman uh, that was part of that group, eventually they named the Excelsiors the Hyde Clarks. Uh, Hyde Clark was a Civil War general who actually was born in Cooperstown, New York. Oh. Uh, so, yeah. But, but I, I would love to find a list uh, with complete names of, of the clubs. Uh, and not just the top nine, but the clubs themselves. So I yeah, can start yeah. cross-referencing family names and looking at genealogy to see the list. Yeah, that's pretty much what I spend all my time doing. But, you know, you know Protoball, right? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I've talked I mean, to them there as well. And I mean, they don't have lists of players, but they do have sources for all the games they cite. So yeah. you can go there and say, what are the first known baseball matches in Iowa? Or... In a, in a particular community. And then, then you have to go to digitized databases and censuses and things, and you know you have to find names. And you know this is a lot of work. And this I did a lot of work like that for my book. Um, it's kind of a detective story because some names are common, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you end up finding out, well, you have three different William Browns, which one is it? It's, it's, and then you find circumstantial evidence that tells you which one it is. But I'm glad you mentioned uh, these New Yorkers and having clubs because one place that I first noticed this was in actually Milwaukee. There was Sons of Excelsior was like a social club. And then I found them in Detroit and other places in the Midwest. Um, I forget the number exactly, but at one point I uh, figured out that I think it was something like 20% of the population of Chicago was born in New York State at a pretty early time, like 1860. So, um, and you know, if you actually um, spend any time in upstate New York, the the way that the the way people speak is pretty similar to the Upper Midwest. If you ever if you're if you're walking down the street in Rome or something, you might think you're in uh, Marshall, Wisconsin, or something. If you know. Well, most of these folks came from the Buffalo, Syracuse area, uh, yeah. and we had a lot of young uh, boys go uh, to uh, Union College in Albany in the 1850s, and then come back to Dubuque that also probably brought the game back through the college connection that you referenced. Yeah. But specifically, is there a list of the names of the members of the Excelsior uh, uh, Social Club in New York that I could start referencing mean, to start cross-matching? You mean the Excelsior Baseball Club? 
the, the baseball club or the 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 society or, or group that yeah, the club group these, owned. As far as I know, those societies were founded by New York expats, and not that it wasn't there wasn't one in New York. But um, do you know the those uh, books called Baseball Pioneers and Baseball Founders, the Saber McFarland publications, that were put together sure, by sure. Saberites? That's a good place to start. I mean, that has all the everything they could find out about the known Excelsiors. And other than that, you know, you got to go find it yourself. Yeah. Which but, is what I've been doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, but those books have a lot of information. They're really a valuable place to start. And, you, you know, they'll often tell you um, what their occupation was and a bit about their non-baseball life, which is really useful. I mean, right, you can thank you very much. The public library has membership lists of the uh, Knickerbockers. And they may, I believe they have one of the Excelsiors from a certain year which, you know, these clubs had hundreds of members that not all of whom were on the first nine. So um, if you want to email me, uh, you know, a specific question, I'll see if I can dig something up like that. I know that there's yeah. a membership list of the Excelsiors. I forget what year it is. But, uh, you know, it, uh, I have a website, howbaseballhappened.com. Um, it has excerpts of the book on it. You can contact me through that. I'll do that. I appreciate it. Anybody else? Yeah, I was going to say your website is really well done. And, um, you know, would, would you be um, interested in talking about the development of the color line? I mean, and racism in early book, baseball? I wrote, and one of my books was about this. Um, yeah. yeah, that, you know, I had a history professor once who told me, um, if you're writing about American history, no matter what you start writing about, like, even the history of the donut, you're gonna end up writing about race. Yep. I think about that every time I write about anything, because you know, you it's a big part of the story. And you know, I mentioned that after the Civil War, um, baseball was um, nervous because uh, it wanted to be a national sport. It aspired to be a national sport, and the Civil War was a massive problem, right? So to the extent that they would be identified with the winning side, they'd be uh, anathema in the South. I mean, the holiday of Thanksgiving was associated with the Union victory. It was declared by Abraham Lincoln in 1863. It wasn't enthusiastically celebrated in the South till people forgot that. Um, and it's understandable. Um, so, uh, uh, what was I saying? Um, oh. So after the Civil War, the people that ran baseball, and it, it could be hard to tell what the motivations are. You know, I can tell you, point out to people like Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald, of the most important baseball man in Philadelphia, who's a passionate anti uh, passionate abolitionist and racial liberal, whose, atti whose attitudes are so modern that it's sort of shocking. Um, it's really hard to generalize about people's, you know, feelings about race and things like that. But um, I often wonder, because baseball did some things like drew the color line in 1867, formally in writing. Um, now, all the clubs that belong to the National Baseball Association were white, but in 1866, a bunch of very respectable uh, black men from Philadelphia tried to join. They were called the Pythians. They were doctors, lawyers, professors. And they thought, well, you know, the, the guy who's in charge of the Pennsylvania State Association was a Quaker abolitionist. They thought there was enough public support that maybe they would have trouble saying no to them. So there was sort of an informal color line. But the guys who ran national baseball in New York got very nervous about this and they sent some people down to put a stop to it. And they did. And they put it in writing. But I've, you know, it's you can't look into people's hearts. And sometimes you wonder whether that was done um, out of hatred, out of racism, out of um, a sense that, like with other institutions in America, somehow we had to reconcile with the South and um, that accepting a certain amount of segregation was the price for national unity. Um, you know, one of the men that the New Yorkers sent down, a guy named Dr. William H. Bell, uh, who may have actually written the exclusion, uh, I know he belonged to a church in New York that was a you know, the preacher was a passionate abolitionist and they were involved in anti-slavery movement. So it may not have been anything personal for him. I don't know. I mean, maybe it doesn't matter, but 
um, it's a really interesting, complicated subject. And I think uh, Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald takes up some space in my book, and I would, you know, direct you to that. But I think about him every time someone says, you know, my this historical figure was a racist, or my grandfather said X, but that was the time. And I think about him because in that time, in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, this guy who was a newspaper publisher of at one point the uh, number one circulation newspaper in Philadelphia is um, banging the drum for integration of baseball, uh, streetcars, the army, everything else. And it's not, doesn't seem to be hurting business. So there was obviously a constituency for that kind of thing. So I think we all, we have a tendency to oversimplify and stereotype. Yeah, it's very complex. And then there's the old idea, historical idea that there were abolitionists and egalitarians. I mean, there were many more abolitionists, people against slavery than people who really believed in um, in the egalitarian society, and there were they they were still there was still an element of racism. Well, I so know it's the, very uh, complex. I mean, the the Northern Army in the Civil War was very divided on this point. Mm -hmm. um, and in my, in my book, I tell the story of a couple of baseball players who were Northerners who actually served in the Confederate Army, and they switched sides after the <laughs> Emancipation Proclamation was being discussed because freeing the slaves was a deal breaker for them. And I didn't even know that such a thing ever happened. And I, don't, I think it was more common than we ever hear about. But, um, you know, I guess on the good news side of it, amateur baseball, which in which uh, social considerations mattered, you know, less and less as the time went on because they were was getting more competitive. But as soon as baseball was for money, as soon as it was a business, there was a huge amount of pressure suddenly to integrate. And baseball did integrate steadily through the 1870s, 80s, into the 90s. And then for reasons that are, you know, you could have another talk about, it went backwards. But, you know, when, it, when, it, when it's all about money, you know, uh, and you can get Frank Grant, who's black to play second base for you, and he's going to hit 350 with power. That's the most important thing, not his skin color. Interesting. Well, I think uh, there, what's uh, I see quite a bit in my research that's fascinating. I'd be interested in, in knowing a little bit more. Uh, in the later 19th century, you saw black teams exhibition games against white teams a lot more than you did a black person on a white team. So there were some acceptable boundaries there as well. We'll play yeah. against you, but we won't play on the same team well, with you. Really and I'm sure point. that was driven by finance as well. Yeah, well, and, and in the amateur era, say, if we all go back, go back to the first New York clubs, some of them are um, basically uh, full of abolitionists and people that are quite racially liberal. Any club called Union in the 1850s was a political statement. Um, and yet they don't have one black player on them. And I often you know wondered why and i think the answer actually isn't that they had any kind of exclusionary policy but the more you get to know new york of that time the, the answer kind of becomes obvious they didn't know any black people so the black and white people in america lived so separately that uh, no when they talk about integrating baseball in the 1860s they're not talking about can you have a black guy and a white team they're talking about well, can the black club be a part of the organization that the white clubs are in? Or can we play a black club on the same field? These things were controversial, but to a modern person, you're, you're reading this and saying, why is that the only issue? Why not? Why doesn't a white team ever happen to have a black player on it? That was something that was probably unthinkable and the issue never came up. Any other comments or questions? This is interesting. Hey, Tom, um, reading the book, I agree with your statement up front. It was really American history. And the more I read into the book, the better the history got. I really was enjoying the history. I think a lot of the baseball I've seen or read over time. So tying the two together uh, really made for a good, uh, an excellent book uh, and understanding the times. Uh, I, I enjoyed that as, as much as the baseball, just so much history. And a lot of it was New York history. And you know, being from uh, Milwaukee originally and, you know, growing up with the old Braves days and, you know, and, and uh, so I, I, anything New York, we generally hate almost as much as Chicago, sometimes more. 
So I was never big on New York, but I'm reading all this history in New York and I thought it was just fascinating and then how it spread across the country. So, so if someone hasn't read the book and you're really into history, that in itself, it makes the book great. And then add the baseball for it to it and that's the bonus. So, so it was, yeah, yeah I really um, enjoyed it. I appreciate that. And, and I tell you the truth, that was the most exciting part for me, you know, really understanding the historical context. And I learned a lot about American history researching this book. Yeah. So. So As thank we did you. reading it, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's just all sorts of nuggets in here and stories, and really highly recommend. So um, I think that's what I really enjoyed about the book as well. And it's um, I know that the name of the book is how baseball happened, but I feel like a lot of it is why baseball happened, um, which was another dimension on the story. Uh, that kind of piqued my interest after like learning a little bit more about 19th century baseball history a while ago and then thinking I was bored of it and now like getting kind of reinterested in it. Um, I do have a question about like I feel like baseball like was kind of I kind of view as baseball as like it was going to happen no matter what but like do you do you think there was a point when you know, baseball might not have happened the way it was. Like, what was the most critical point in the history of the sport where maybe we wouldn't have That's the a baseball good we have today? Well, um, by baseball, you mean the New York version of baseball, right? Correct. I mean, yeah, we as we know it. This, yeah, but I think the thing that really pulled so much energy into the New York game was something that it had aside from the power and prestige of New York, because Philadelphia was plenty powerful and plenty rich, and Boston was no small town either. They had their own bat and ball games that were, that were um, you know, driven into extinction. But there was something they didn't have that New York had, and it was a booming city across the river that saw itself as its rival. And Brooklyn was a separate city before 1898. And Brooklyn was growing, and the whole spirit of the place, which was sort of open to new things and experimentation, and it was a boom town. Um, it went from 20,000 to 200,000 in you know, about 30 years. Um, it wanted to beat New York in every possible way. And so the, that is the first city rivalry in baseball history. And it pulled lots and lots and lots of energy into the game. And, and I have spent a lot of time tracing crowd size at baseball games. And it, early amateur era, you know, if 45 people were at a game, it would be remarked upon. That's a big group of people. Because it wasn't, it was, baseball was like your Sunday softball game. It wasn't a spectator sport. The people watching were probably friends of the players. In some cases, gamblers. But that hundreds and several hundred and even thousands of people start showing up in the late 1850s when a Brooklyn team is playing a Manhattan team and the Brooklyn teams are now suddenly competitive with the Manhattan team, Manhattan being New York City. And that created a, pulled a huge amount of energy into the game. And I think that created a sort of better athletic product pretty quickly. So that when the Excelsiors take their little tour of upstate New York and they go to New England and the middle Atlantic states, they're impressive athletes doing something that people who might've played the Philadelphia version, the Boston version, can't imagine them doing. And I have eyewitness accounts where they're just saying, you know, holy cow, I mean, <laughs> Creighton is throwing the ball the catcher's catching it before our batters get the bat off their shoulders. And they're so fast and they're such good fielders. Because, and I think all this polish and athleticism isn't because they were supermen, it's because there were thousands and thousands of people that have been drawn into the game, young men, because of the rivalry. So I think that is the thing that made, you know, it's, it's at least a major factor, if not the biggest factor, and why it was this game and not some other game. And you know, it's not unthinkable that we could have ended up being a cricket playing nation. You know, look at around, look around the world and how many British colon, ex-British colonies that have a lot of grievances against the English play cricket. So that could have happened. It seems like a lot of things could have been different. You know, the anti-British sentiment and then the, the, the rail, like you said, transportation really drove it. So if you never developed the railroad, railroad for a while, maybe it wouldn't have spread. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, how the transportation system evolved is, and it, it didn't have to happen the way it did. You know, there were, there were different ideas about, was it going to be about canals? Was it going to be about rivers? Was it going to be about railroads? Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot to, it sheds a lot of light on baseball. You know, um, 
I met somebody from a place called Paulet, Vermont. It's a small town. And I told them that's where one of the first baseball clubs in Vermont was formed. Saying like, why? There's like 800 people there. And it was a place where the railroad stopped for a while. It was the mm -hmm. furthest extent of the railroad and a bunch of New Yorkers ended up there. Um, but it's a fascinating question to me. Any other questions before we do our book giveaway? So do you have a preferred way for people to get the book? I know in, if you live in Milwaukee, it's at Boswell Books. The I have the hardcover version. Oh, I always think you can buy it at a bookstore if you can. Yeah, Boswell Books in there's Milwaukee. A and there's an audio book and there's a Kindle and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I like the guy yeah. who read my book. He, he I'm sorry, what was that? The, the actor they hired to read my book is pretty good. Oh, he, really? He can't pronounce uh, Massachusetts place names, but that's his only fault. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Let's get the book drawing done. Did you do numbers, Dennis? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tom, do you want to pick a number between 1 and 14? OK. Um, how about the number of my favorite player as a kid? Nine. Ten Number Williams? nine. No, it was Roger Maris. Roger Maris. Should I was a New Yorker watching there, yeah. Uh, Brian T. I became a Cardinal fan because of that. Oh, really? That's how much I loved Roger Maris. Brian's still on here. Let's see. Brian, are you still out there? So I'm sitting here earlier. I okay, bored I'm going to look. Off the show? Uh, Brian has left the building, I think. Yeah, I think he has. I could try to contact him, or should we just pick another number? I don't know how long he's hung in. Uh, group, what do you want to do? It's pretty easy. Everybody else wants a chance of winning the book. So. I think you should stay to the bitter end to win a book. But that's okay. just my hard ass view. Of okay. okay. Um, Let's see. Well, I can renumber in the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, number nine. Let me see. Uh, Ken Carano's still on. We could, uh, Ken, Ken becomes a new nine. You were 10, Ken. You, you're the winner of the book. All right. Ken, you know, I, I already have the audio book, which was absolutely wonderful. So uh, I would say go ahead and uh, pass that on to, uh, to someone else who might, uh, might enjoy another enjoy a copy. Thank okay. you. Yeah, that's nice of you to do. Yeah. A beautiful book. Any, yeah. Is there any, is there a group of, is, that, is there anyone, how, those who have not read the book, who has not read the book yet? Francis? I can't, people aren't showing, so we could redo this. Maybe they all read it. Yeah, could be. No, usually, yeah, a lot of times, a lot of people Tony, haven't read Tony, the book. And... Something Tony up here said he hasn't. Dave Heller, uh, Dave Heller has on making comments out there. Okay. I have it, so I'll take my name out of the drawing. I've read it and have the book. Okay. Thank you. I don't know what Mike Carey's been doing, but he hasn't read it yet. Yeah. Uh, Comments, comments. Oh, God, I hate using this tablet. Oh, God, don't lose everybody. Let's see. I got four names, but that's just me. I'm not using the, I don't see where comments comes up on this goofy thing. You don't have a chat yet yeah, where, where it says more. With Does the three blue dots. You go into the chat. Oh, yeah. Yep, got it. Thank you. Um, uh, Mike has it, uh, Dave, Tony, uh, Jack's halfway through it. Do you want the second half of the book, Jack? No. Um, okay. Uh, Tom's read it as well. Tom in New York has read the book. Okay. Um, and where I've been, I've got four names on this group. Is anybody who's, I, I've got Francis, Tony, um, like, oh, I'm reading my own writing here. Tony Malika, maybe. I have no clue what I have there. Dave Heller, Mike Carey. Anybody else? 
came and do these numbers randomly. So since there's only four, um, yeah, on a drawing between one and four. Uh, I don't know, Derek Jeter. Number two. Yeah. Number two. Okay, Dave Heller. Hey, Dave. All right. Uh, thank you. I'm a little. A little worrisome Derek Jeter was the reason, but that's okay. I'm looking forward to reading. <laughs> you don't have to be Yankees haters. So. Yeah. So I, I put my I, I um I put my email in the chat. So just send me an email, Dave. Okay. And give me your address. I will do that uh, I, right now before I forget. Thank you. I, Mary, I can thank you, I, Thomas. I can, thank you for the presentation. Very yeah, good. I, Mary, I can send it out. Okay, well, we'll, we'll bicker between ourselves. Yeah. 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 Okay. Next time you're, you're in Brooklyn, Mary, let's get some pierogies or something. Oh, I owe you big time. Pierogies are, uh, yeah, you know what? Tell me where to go in Greenpoint and I will see you there. Good old Jack. We, we can go. So uh, get in touch. Yeah, I probably won't be there until the spring. I was just there in October, but I'm always wanting to see my daughter. So do you ever go to the Radigast? Of course. In Williamsburg? Yeah, I like that place too. But I, I, I'm more into pierogies. Yeah, so. well, there's a really good pierogi place. Oh, excellent. Really well, I'm going to hold you to that. So okay, and I will deal. take you out for pierogies and whatever cocktails or drinks you want. So, um, yeah. So give me a heads up and we'll do it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was my yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us and spending your time. And obviously people really enjoy your book. So we're looking forward to James Creighton. Oh, uh, well, um, I'll get to right to work. Get to work. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you thank you all right thank just you. before thank you go you. I, I just want to say a happy birthday to maude nelson she's she's one of the old bloomer girls she wow. she's incredible um she pitched she was a great pitcher and third base uh player and she scouted she owned teams and she and like wow. james creighton she should be in the hall the hall of fame so happy birthday to maude nelson okay happy birthday Tom, can you stop that for that thank, you, uh, make thank you for for hosting us and and, and inviting uh you inviting bet. us to join this this uh, you great Tom, presentation. Before you, Tom, before you sign off, can you stop the recording? Because I can't at this end. Oh yeah.